a Build Hatch developed production. On this week's episode of Build Hatch, I had a very entertaining and humorous discussion with the one and only Callan Heron from structural engineering firm Apical Engineering. This was a very entertaining sit-down, as you'll no doubt tell when you listen. Cal is a very relatable character, and I really like how he is aware of how to adjust when dealing with different types of clients, whether it be the high flyers or the average Joe. Cal isn't afraid to just work through it and develop a workable and customised solution for the end user in mind. Cal is a structural engineer and is very down to earth. I think you'll enjoy this week's episode of Build Hatch as much as I did, so let's get into it. Cal Heron, welcome to Build Hatch. Cheers, Az. Thanks for having me. That's okay. So before we uh, hear about your structural engineering firm, I thought we'd go back to your childhood. So where did you grow up? Mate, I, um, I grew up in Dudley, coastal suburb uh, in Newcastle. I was pretty fortunate to grow up there, spent a lot of time outside, um, surfing, fishing, just generally running in muck. Um, yeah, two pretty hardworking parents. Dad worked for himself as a sparky. Um, yeah, younger sister and we, yeah, pretty close family and still, still are, so. And Dudley, for anyone listening that's not familiar with Newcastle's, a really great beachside suburb, um, has a mixture of things, but yeah, incredible surf's one of them. Certainly, certainly. So if you're a surfer growing up here, it would have been a great Mate, upbringing. It was paradise. We'd walk, we'd walk down the beach before school, after school. Yeah, very fortunate to to have the luxury of it being so close. And going back to school, did you set out to do a trade or did you go right through to year 12? I uh, went right through to year 12. Um, my old man being the leco took me to work from a young age. I was crawling under houses uh, pretty early on, clipping cable and stuff like that, giving him a hand. And he basically said, like, this is why you've got to go to school so you're not doing this shit like me. Um, little did he know I'd turn out to be an engineer and i get in roofs and go under houses now. Don't actually physically have to swing the hammer, but you're still getting into those places. So, yeah, I'd, I was a, I'm a bit of a nerd. Like, you wouldn't necessarily realise that talking to me. I'm a bit of a larrikin and stuff. But, yeah, it wasn't one with words as such, but loved, loved the numbers. So I'd always been quite interested in maths uh, and... From a young age? From a young age, yeah. I was, mum said I used to count things all the time and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I'd, I thought I'd go to uni. I didn't know what I'd necessarily do or anything like that. But my dad did, jo- did work for um, an engineer at a local firm um, and got me some work experience there when I was in year 10. And I thought, yeah, this, is, this is pretty good. I could do it like... He was modelling a coal washery in finite element analysis and we'd basically run this thing through the dynamics model and you'd watch it move and do all that, obviously exaggerated, but I was like, yeah, I can handle that. Like, this is pretty cool. And, yeah, I did a swag of different um, work experience things with different people. I, one of the first ones I did was at Cardiff at EDI Rail back in the day and I walked around with a star picket and had to bang the hardwood sleepers on the rail line to see if they were rotted or not. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I – is this is this engineering? <laughs> I don't really know if this is what I want to do, but it seemed all right. And then, yeah, did a few more things and, yeah, ended up going to uni and stuff. And Okay, so getting into university and studying engineering, you need some pretty good marks to get into that. Yeah, it's a pretty reasonable mark and there's certain prerequisites – that they recommended as well, like a certain level of maths and physics and things like that. I was um, I was pretty lucky. I was sort of on the cusp, um, but because of the I'd done the, the recommended subjects, I um, yeah got accepted into civil engineering and surveying the double degree, um, and yeah started that. But then when I went working for the coal loader, they were like, oh, surveying doesn't really offer anything to us. Would you mind looking at? a different sort of thing you can sort of go back to the just straight degree or if you want to pick something else up go for it and I've always been pretty conscious of the environment and sustainability and different things like that Um, so I took on environmental engineering um, as my second degree which was yeah which was really good it was challenging um, but yeah it suited 
the work we were doing over there and stuff as well. So they were happy. I was happy and yeah. So did you have to work like a couple of days a week or was it uni at night? How did that work? Yeah, so I my minimum working week was 28 hours and they worked off a 35-hour week. So I had technically seven hours to do uni. Um, anyone that's done an engineering degree knows that you don't get a whole lot done in seven hours. Uh, I'm a bit of a glutton for punishment and because they only wanted me to do two subjects a semester, but it would have meant being double degree, I was going to be at uni for fucking years. <laughs> so I thought, no, nah, I'm going to bust myself. So I actually did three subjects a semester. Um, yeah, some semesters I was doing more uni hours than I was work hours. Um, and they were quite accommodating. Like I'd get a bit of flexibility when we had shutdowns on and things like that. I could work nights and stuff in a supervisor role and different bits and pieces to allow me to still get the uni done through the day. Um, but yeah, it was, wasn't was easy. Um, they were a very challenging sort of four years. So I turned a five-year degree. It took me six years to do a five-year double degree basically. So an extra 12 months when it could have been an extra few years sort of thing so it was it was all right it would have been quite a juggle i'd imagine oh, yeah there wasn't a lot of socializing going on like people talk about how much fun they had going to uni and getting on the piss and carrying on and i went to uni i studied and i got out of there because that was sort of it my free time i'd try and get a few waves in have a few beers with the boys but that was pretty much me. And then I was <laughs> I was cooked by the end of it because all you want to do is catch up on some sleep. <laughs> but, yeah, I wouldn't change it, though. I, I wouldn't change it. It was, yeah, it was good fun. All right. So you were working, what, at, at, at the coal loader at that time? Yeah. So yeah. You, right throughout your whole degree? Only for four years. So uh, the last year was, yeah, pretty full on and stuff. And I ended up, yeah, leaving there and doing that. Um, on, off my own bat and just uh, getting doing a bit of part time work here and there. I was actually employed as a boiler maker. Would you believe it for a local conveyor belt mob? Um, I'd become quite friendly with those guys from working at the coal loader, and yeah, they took me on, and um, I just basically slotted around them, and it was good. Like I had my time uni timetable, and I'd sort of pull a day a week, or if they had weekend work, they'd get me in for that, or afternoon shift and stuff. So kept a bit of money ticking over um and yeah get the study done as well so it was yeah i was lucky to be able to have that opportunity yeah that's great and at some point did you make a pivot to sort of focus from environmental engineering into structural yeah i my main focus was always the structural side of things um love steel concrete timber and that i'd always sort of from a young age i'd had a hammer in my hand I think my parents have done four renos on the house that they still live in now and I was always involved in that. My grandfather was a plumber and he had a pretty cool shed set up so as kids we're always banging nails into something in the shed and yeah, I like that side of things more than the environmental and that was, yeah, that was the avenue that I wanted to take. I, I did a little bit of Enviro stuff for a, a local firm um, while I was still at uni for my last year but yeah it it was good but there's a lot of report writing and things like that and like i said before i'm more of a numbers guy than a (laughs) than a words guy a practical kind of guy yeah yeah i um yeah made that sort of conscious decision to put a lot of emphasis on the structural rather than the enviro okay so cal you you finished university and graduated what what did you do after that um so Throughout the last year, you sort of go through a few graduate programs and things like that because you you want to get into a oh, a decent firm to continue growing your knowledge and stuff like that because, as everyone knows, you don't learn everything at uni. There's still plenty more to go. Um, you learn at uni what you how little you don't know. Exactly right. <laughs> I remember like one of my first days going, what are they teaching you at uni sort of thing? Like, <laughs> so, but, yeah, I... Um, I was going sort of through the yeah the graduate programs with a few of the bigger bigger firms um, and wasn't making the cut. You know, you'd have an interview, you'd do all the psychometric testing and all the bullshit that goes with it, and 
yeah, you'd get to sort of the final one or two and then you'd get the call, oh, sorry, mate, not successful. And you, you get a bit bummed about it and stuff. And you're like, well, I've just done all this study, can't get a gig, I've got experience, you know, what's a go? And a couple of mates um, who are a few years older than me um, went to uni with a guy who has a little firm down the central coast and went in for an interview with him and, you know, had the suit on and all that looking good. I walked in and the first thing he said, he goes, do you like wearing that suit and tie, mate? And I said, mate, it does not feel natural to me at all. He goes, yeah, we don't fucking wear them round here. <laughs> and that's when I thought, I thought, oh, <laughs> I'll fit right in here. <laughs> um, yeah, and he turned out to be a yeah really good mentor and sort of guy who's pretty loose cannon. Um, <laughs> but knew his staff and taught me plenty and I've still got connections through different people that I met whilst working with him which was really good so um, worked with them down the central coast for about 18 months then decided to go surfing overseas for about nine months so threw the towel in and yeah packed up me and a mate went overseas and yeah started at the world cup in brazil um in 2014 and yeah basically circumnavigated south america bought a car and yeah, it was – had a ball, basically. Just lived it up. Yeah, lived it up. Um, Made up for all the university time. Exactly right. And because I'd done that, I sort of had the cash there to to do it, I suppose. Um, so I was fortunate about that. Uh, didn't have a mortgage or anything to worry about at that point, which was really good. And, yeah, we uh, we had a ball. But then – yeah, not no engineering was being done during, <laughs> during that time. Quite the um, opposite. <laughs> quite the opposite. But plenty of surfing. Plenty of surfing. Um, ended up coming back and got in touch with some guys that I met. Oh, long story short, I got a scholarship to for my um, final year thesis. I did a lot of um, corrosion stuff on cast iron bridge bridge pipes, piles, sorry, um, to be specific. And it was through the Australasian Corrosion Association and I met a few guys through that that were doing sort of more durability things and more industrial stuff. And but having the background from the coal loader, it was natural to slot back in there. So um, did you just reach out to these guys yeah. or did you follow these guys closely? The the uni prof- professor put me onto it and said, I think you should do this because he wanted me to go up to this the conference that they have once a year and present the paper that we'd written. So I basically did all the research, found all the results and um, did my thesis and stuff and then he wrote a paper on it. Um, I didn't have heaps to, to, to do with the paper, a little bit in pieces but nothing, not like he's the top dog sort of thing. <laughs> And, yeah, he said, oh, apply for this scholarship, you'll get it, um, and then we'll, they'll pay for you to come up to Brisbane and present the paper and stuff. And I was like, yeah, sweet, sounds like a good gig. And the job that I had after uni was pretty much all residential stuff, was no industrial sort of things there, a little bit of commercial, but mainly concentrated on the residential stuff. So when I hit my boss up and said, oh, look, mate, need a couple of days off, going to Brisbane to present this. He's like, yeah, what are you doing that for, mate, sort of thing? Like, Because there was no value in it for him. Um, but he was like, yeah, mate, go go for it. And, yeah, went up there and met a few guys and there's a um, local company in town that just a small small firm that do a, a lot of that sort of stuff nationally, basically. Like, So when I got back from overseas, I contacted those guys, um, went in for an interview and, yeah, jagged the job, which was good. And, yeah, I did modelled conveyors that were spanning 30 metres over roads and rail lines. I um, ended up getting my UAV licence to fly um, drones. So we were flying drones under the road bridges and rail bridges up the valley and stuff like that to inspect the condition of the headstocks and the bolts and stuff like that because it wasn't practical to scaff them out or anything like that. So, yeah, we zooming around in the drones and stuff trucks going 100k's past you trains running over the top it was pretty wild but yeah did a lot of more lot like big stuff we did a lot of concrete testing in tanks and things like that and yeah it was good but oh, i was definitely enjoyed the residential side of things more so yeah was always looking to get back at that and 
I had a few people contact me um, when I'd gotten back and said, like, oh, what are, you, what are you doing? You know, like, we like working with you. Um, can you sort the house out or do whatever? And I hit my boss up and said, like, oh, mate, like, do you want to run it through you? He's like, oh, mate, you you take care of it and um, just do it, do it on the side kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, do it on the side. But if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to help you out. So I was like, oh, shit, that's a pretty cool thing. So just – got an ABN and got some insurance and stuff and away I went. Um, and it was all above board and, you know, he was happy, I was happy and asked him a couple of questions along the way but wasn't doing anything too ludicrous. It was just, yeah, mainly sort of the residential Stock stuff. Stock standard sort yeah. of stuff. Um, and it just sort of was word of mouth and, yeah. And I, I get the feeling just from sitting down and talking with you today that you're the kind of guy that, you can master things like you're obviously a very practical guy and being an engineer and you've also got this very practical persona about you but you just, I just get the feeling you're the kind of guy that you can master some, you can learn how to fly a drone and go do it master it yep onto the next thing learn about you were talking about before about corrosion and structures and things like that I'll go learn that overcome it understand it right onto the next thing so is that am I am I correct in saying that? Yeah, you're probably not far wrong. Um, I definitely, I definitely like a challenge, and yeah, once it's not so much like a, a tick and flick sort of thing, but once I've yeah gotten past that challenge and feel sort of comfortable, I do like looking for something else just to keep keep active. Like I said, I'm a bit of a nerd, so things like I don't know keep me on my toes. I like that. Um, I don't just sort of want to sit back and cruise and just be like, oh, yeah, knock a beam out here, do that, just draw a house slab. It's There's there's more to it than that, I suppose. So, And so you started working on the side um, with your residential sort of engineering in terms of structural engineering. Did you always set out to work for yourself? Um, I think I'd always thought I would. Like my grandfather, plumber, worked for himself. Dad's Sparky worked for himself, um, and I'd always seen like, the hard work that they'd put in, but then the reward with like yeah, family time, that flexibility and stuff like that. And I thought, yeah, I, I think I'd like that because engineering's like you get your pound of flesh out of your employees, sort of thing. And yeah, it's like this unwritten, it's not an unwritten law, but it's like an unwritten agreement that you punch out the overtime and you don't get paid and you're just happy that you've got a job sort of thing. Like not saying that everybody's like that, but the few the few experiences that I've had working at different firms, um, you do re- what's required to get the job done and, yeah, you might get a pat on the back at the end or whatever, you might not. It's just part and parcel. And it's and it's not a high turnover industry either or profession, no. is it? No, they like you're locked in, you've got your job and – yeah, away you go. Like you, you're happy that you've got a job, and yeah, you just do the work, and away you go. Um, not that I needed praise or anything like that for for doing work, but I was always of the opinion you get out what you put in, and I felt like I was putting in a lot, and it wasn't coming back. And at that younger age, you you're all about the dollars, and I'm like, what are you doing, mate? Like. I can see what you're charging me out at and you're sort of taking the piss a little bit. <laughs> and I understand that there's like running costs and all that sort of stuff and, yeah, you've got to reinvest a bit to, for training and all that sort of stuff. But, yeah, if I'm sitting there till 7 o'clock on a Friday night, buy me a carton of beer or something, mate. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I'm a bit old school like that, I suppose. Not that I wanted like, oh, yeah, I'll mark down three hours overtime or whatever it might be, but... Yeah, book a brother up. <laughs> um, so I'd sort of always like, if I'm going to work till 7 o'clock on a Friday, I'll go surfing on Monday and rock up at 10. Like, <laughs> you know, that that's how it worked. But uh, the people I worked for didn't really see it that way. So it, most employers probably don't, to be honest. Um, but I was like, well, maybe, I've, maybe I am better suited working for myself and – trying to get that flexibility and that work-life balance. Haven't found that, but <laughs> striving for it, <laughs> striving for it. 
So, yeah, I'd, I'd always been in the back of my mind that, you know, going out on your own would be a another step down the track. So, so had you thought of a name for your business back then? No, I had no idea. I was literally calling myself Callan Heron. That was it <laughs> uh, with an ABN. So my wife is a yeah pretty witty, um, smart lady and she came up with Apical, which has Cal in it, um, but also Appy means the – Apical means the apex in Latin, uh, but Appy means bee, and I'm a bit of a hobbyist beekeeper. Okay. So that sort of came into it, and it comes up in the alphabet pretty early on, so I was like, sure. yeah, sweet. I didn't think about it when you'd have to tell people what it was as part of your email address, and what is it, A-Pickle? Is it <laughs> Appy? Apical, well, and I'm just like, yeah, mate, you can call it whatever you like. And this is just how you spell it, so you can send me the email, sort of thing. But yeah, it's a good talking point. Um, yeah, some people get a bit of a laugh out of it and stuff too. And yeah, it's funny when you get a call. Yeah, mate, uh, is this? And they get a bit hesitant because they don't want to offend you. I think too. So I'm like, yeah, mate, that's me. That's me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, so you. You uh, are. <laughs> okay. I'm providing the laughs. <laughs> yeah, it's very happy, actually. Okay, so you uh, so you're still working full time and juggling, just doing some work on the side. Word of mouth, probably the most form of referral. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, so how did that? Did that just get to a point where it outgrew what you could put the hours in, or how, how did that work? It sort of it sort of did. Like I got to the point where I was doing sort of three to four nights a week and not seeing the missus and stuff and it was it was leading up to our wedding actually. We were getting married in the November. Um and yeah, weddings aren't cheap, so I was trying to punch out as much as I could to, you know, pump the pump the dollars up. And I um when I was at uni there was a mature age student there, an older guy who was who's a retired policeman and came back and restudied engineering and I yeah, became friendly with him because he was there. He wasn't going out socialising or anything like that either. <laughs> he was just ripping in then had to go home to his family. So him and I were on the same boat and he um he started doing a bit of work for an older guy um, that was nearing the end of his career and, yeah, it got to the point where they were actually mates and were going travelling around Australia for 12 months in their caravans. So they sort of hit me up and they're like, we're going away, do you, do you want to sort of take over? And I was like, shit, shit, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Um, ended up sort of saying yes. And so it was like I'd be my own entity. But, yeah, they took me around to their a few of their clients and basically said, look, we're going away, and the uh, the older guy was like, "I'm, I'm going to hang the boots up, um, use Cal now." And for most people, they were like, "Yeah, sweet, like your recommendations, pretty good." So I was like, "All right, this is like you don't get a leg up like that in business." I um I remember talking to one of my mates who's a financial planner, um, and he's just like, "Oh yeah, so you're buying his book?" And I was like, "Oh, he's just giving it to me." And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, he's just happy that someone's still servicing the clients. Like, and he's like, no, no, no. Like, there's, there's got to be a catch. There's got to be a catch. And I was like, no, I think he just likes me, mate. And i yeah, he's he's forty plus years my senior, this bloke. But I hold him in pretty high regard, and he's probably one of my closest mates, if you know what I mean. Like, we still talk pretty regularly, and um. He's a bit of a mentor to me than I'm any sort of curly ones that I'm a bit stuck on and stuff. I'll bounce things off him and, yeah, he helps me out. And He's still doing a little bit. You know, he's been trying to retire for the last 20 years, I think. Um, but, yeah, it's sort of – that was a huge boost for my sort of confidence. Like taking the plunge going out on your own is – It's not it's, easy. No. Nah. So at that point, when, when it sort of all happened, I yeah, quit my job in the November – we got mar- had sort of a couple of weeks off. We got married, went overseas for a month for a honeymoon, came back and we had two mortgages um, at that point. 
and the missus was working full time and I was like, shit, <laughs> I've got to got to sort of pull my weight here, you know, like we're dropping back to one wage, got the two houses and stuff. It was it was scary. Um, and the old bloke was like, oh, mate, just wake up to yourself. You'll be fine sort of thing. But there's always that in the back of your mind. You're like, oh, what if the phone doesn't ring? Like, But, yeah, I'd let quite a few people know and had some good contacts sort of I'd already set up. And then obviously with these ones um, that the old fella gave me, it was just like, away you go and yeah I hit the ground running sort of thing and it's just grown and grown from there and I don't really advertise or anything now sort of word of mouth is what what happens I throw a few signs on a couple of fences and stuff like that but that's pretty much me and yeah I'm just I'm forever in his debt basically um isn't it funny that and I seem to be referring to this every week now that even today in 2020 with all of the social media, all of the marketing and advertising mediums that are available, word of mouth referrals just seems to be the number one form of marketing. 100%. I still get calls now that, oh, mate, yeah, got your number off my brother's uncle's son's nephew. Um, You did a job for him (laughs) however many years ago. And I'm like, yeah, mate, I don't remember but yeah yeah sweet let's roll let's roll with it for all intensive purposes i certainly did i must have done a good one that's why you're calling me at least you don't say oh yeah i remember jimmy yeah uh, yeah <laughs> oh you mean luke <laughs> <laughs> but I, I in some cases too i don't actually on sort of smaller jobs and stuff i don't actually talk to the builder if there's enough detail on the plans and the builder's pretty good he'll get my plans and just go with it so then when he goes to another job and says oh look you need engineering oh yeah call this bloke and yeah i got your number off so and so and i'm like i don't know them like i'm not sure and they're like yeah yeah, yeah you did um you did a couple of jobs for him through so and so and everyone's like oh yeah okay sweet he must like what i do so yeah which, which is great like that's it's flattering to to know that people are happy with my stuff and yeah want me to keep working with them sort of thing so yeah very lucky very lucky and so you started off just word of mouth and repeat business that way have you ever done any marketing as such i got an instagram um a couple of couple of years ago and sort of rely on other people to post content and then i just share it um tag yourself in 100 percent. and yeah one of the guys at the architecture firm that we met through i was like mate make sure you tag me like so i can share it so people know that i'm actually doing something yeah and um yeah it's it's really good like i i don't know if i get leads from there or anything like my website still says coming soon it said that for about (laughs) three years now so i will eventually that's the secret formula (sighs) mate i'm there's no sort of bells and whistles like i still yeah, I've got a calculator and a pencil and a ruler and I do a lot of stuff by hand. There's no sort of fancy gizmos and that going on in the background. It it just happens. So I um yeah, I don't really market as such. I just if there's a job with a sort of good perspective, like on a road and stuff, I'll definitely throw a sign on it if I'm driving past or if I've got to do an inspection there, I'm like, Oh yeah, perfect, this'll do. Um but yeah. That's pretty much it. And so word of mouth has been huge for me. I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't wasn't for that and yeah, the, the repeat customers. And I, I have a funny feeling it might be your personality that people <laughs> like as well. Yeah, <laughs> that, that could be it. That could be it. I I'll, I'll like to think I'm relatable. Um, I've, when I was first turned 18, I got a job in a bottle shop and you see everyone at the bottle shop like – from the, the big wig high flyers to, yeah, apprentices and, you know, whoever else. So you learn pretty quickly to, to be able to talk to those, to, to all walks of life, I guess. So I've always been pretty comfortable, whether you're rocking up to a client meeting or something like that and being able to talk to this person who's about to invest a large amount of money to you get to site and the concrete is there sweating his ass off. <laughs> laying steel and you can have a chat to him and he just doesn't think you're a dickhead straight off the bat you know it takes me a little while to develop that but <laughs> you know like 
he's been reading your plans for the last two days, cursing you, like, why has he done this? What's he doing here? Why is there so much steel in it? And you get there and you start talking to him. He's like, God, you seem like all right, mate. Like, And, yeah, I I think that goes a long way. Like, I don't want to blow smoke up my ass or anything like that, but I like to be able to talk to people, mate. They, oh, I don't know if I can say this on the podcast, but they shit and piss the same as I do, you know. Yeah. They're, no one's sort of that special. I think it's about having that persona and being able to relate to people. And like you said, uh, there's no better way of dealing with people, whether it's they're a big wig, high flyer, or just the average Joe off the street. Yeah. If you can talk to those people and just talk the talk and chew the fat, I think you go a long way and they respect you for it. I Yeah, I think that's that's been really beneficial for me because obviously like you're making some pretty big decisions for them when they're spending their money if they're doing a renovation or whatever. So if you're not relatable, it's not like they don't trust you because obviously you've got qualifications and all that sort of stuff, but they feel more comfortable if they can have a conversation with you and you explain to them, well, look, you need that beam there because your bathroom's upstairs, there's a bit of weight in that bath and, you know, like, yeah, we're opening up down here and this is going to be a great area for you and your kids and what have you. Like, I'm no architect or anything, but you sort of, you talk the talk and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, the beam's going to hang down a little bit, isn't it? I was like, yeah, well, we can put a bigger one in, um, like a, a shallower one that's got a wider flange and all that and go to steel, whatever, and they're like, Oh, yeah, yeah. And you, you give them a couple of options and they're like, oh, he knows what he's talking about. Like, nice bloke, yeah. And then they're having a barbecue with some friends and their friends are looking to build a house. Oh, i got to talk to this bloke. Like, so, yeah. It's funny because Alastair Gus from McCormack's Engineers in Melbourne, he was on the show a couple of weeks ago and he was saying the same thing. He, he's a big snow skier. And he was saying from just getting on the chairlift in the early days and talking to people or going into a lunchroom on a large site in Melbourne where there's 150 guys yeah. having their crib breaks. It's amazing what you can learn just by talking to people. Like I, I actually related to that when I was listening to that to that um, podcast. And yeah, it's pretty funny because you it's true. You're sitting on the chairlift and if you're just cruising solo, I'm a bit of an avid snowboarder myself and – you can sit there and just sort of be rude and not say anything or you can have a chat and it's interesting the people that you meet on the chairlift, you know, like because they come from all walks of life as well. Um, I sort of remember distinctly when I was at the coal loader, there's a very us and them culture with the the white collar and the blue collar side of things. And that's it's a heavily unionised type heavily, environment. yeah, and... Basically, it was like staffies and the tradies. And I was um, I was lucky enough to do this um, preventative maintenance optimization sort of task force, I suppose, with a couple of the tradies um, on the Kuragang site. And they were sort of pretty hesitant to be really even talking to me, um, but then got to know them and became sort of mates of them and then... I'd walk into their lunchroom and have lunch with them and I remember the first time I walked in there, I was shitting myself because, like, these are the sort of guys you walk past in the corridor and they look through you. <laughs> and I was like, far out. I was almost shaking sort of thing and go in there and it just sort of went quiet. And I'd sat down with a couple of the other apprentices because we were all of a similar age and, um, we'd done sort of training courses together and stuff so I knew them and spoke to them and yeah then Jeff walked in and said hello to me and when he did that then everybody was like went back to normal because he sort of pulled a bit of weight and yeah that was pretty distinct for me and then since then these guys would sort of not go out of their way to help me but if I had a question or had a problem needed their help They'd sort of look out, look you, out for me. You were one of them. Yeah. yeah. And I actually got seconded to be the mechanical maintenance supervisor for a couple of months when um, at Carrington when one of the guys went on leave. And, yeah, I couldn't believe, like, just from, I suppose, these guys talking to the other trades and that, they'd, like, help me out because I, I didn't have any idea about sort of mechanical stuff like bearings and 
pulleys. I make sure it doesn't move, but <laughs> that's pretty much sort of the extent that I had. And I was, yeah, really fortunate that these guys sort of took me under their wing. And when we were a bit quiet, one of the boys taught me how to TIG weld and stuff like that. And yeah, they sort of, they set me up and that was a, a big thing for me to be able to yeah, have the confidence to be dealing with those guys. But then, yeah, you'd see how they'd interact with the other staff members and yeah, it was like chalk and cheese. <laughs> so it's funny how it works. I think that's rapport as well, building up that rapport. And yeah. like you mentioned, going to a construction site and talking to the the boots on the ground, you know, the guy that's actually building your structure that you actually designed yeah. and having that relationship with him. It's very important. Especially when he's got the shits with you because you've had him <laughs> dying steel all day. <laughs> and he's like, mate, what? And then you, you explain it to him. And I've had a few times where guys have been cursing me when I've got there, like, oh, this is overdone, rah, rah, rah. And you're like, oh, mate, see this here. Like, you need all that steel in there because that's actually retaining this. When this gets bloody backfilled, it's a fair bit of dirt sitting there. So we've got to cut the pot out, steal it right up. He's like, oh, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And once you say that, they're your best mate sort of thing. Yeah, like, that's right. Yeah, so that's been beneficial in, I suppose, the business in having that, you, yeah, you can talk to those people and get you a long way, I think. So you mentioned earlier that you had a mentor. What about during busy times? Like, do you have someone you can call on to help you during busy times? Yeah, I I call on the old bloke. Um, he helps me out with sort of site visits when I can't get there. Um, other than that, it's just buckle down the hatches and... You give the missus a kiss in the morning and then you don't see her till the next morning when because <laughs> you're rolling into bed at midnight, one o'clock, something like that. But yeah. And that's what I mean. This excuse me, the work life balance is, is not there yet. Um I'm I'm at the stage where I could probably do with some help, maybe. I don't know. I'm just I'm not not hesitant to do it, but I'm yeah. I don't want to do it and then everything slows down and you're like, oh, I've got this mouth to feed, I feel bad sort of thing. So I'm just, yeah, I'll just wait and see. I'm not against growing or anything like that, but I'm pretty happy with where I'm at and the service that I can provide people. And as I said, just by sitting here and talking to you today, I think your business, your business name, I'm looking at your shirt and the brand, everything about you, it does seem to come down to Cal. Yeah. And and I don't want to lose that because I don't want – engineers are typically – well, everyone knows an engineer, I suppose, and they know <laughs> what they're like. I'm not really your typical engineer, I don't think, from what people have said. So, yeah, I'm nervous about putting someone on or whatever that's pretty straight and <laughs> starts doesn't. pissing people off, going to site. and Doesn't want to go surfing. Yeah. It's like you got to have a surf on your lunch break every now and again, mate. Like that's part of it. <laughs> Start late if you're going fishing or whatever. So yeah, uh, well, you might have to buy him beers. Oh. For extra hours. And that's, if you're putting in the time, there's a carton of piss, mate. <laughs> for our listeners out there who are listening to this, and if they have their own engineering firm or architectural practice or any other sort of consulting business, what did advice would you have for those guys on how they can add value to a particular project or or a client i think anyone can draw a pretty picture so you've got to try and set yourself set yourself apart a little bit like i um engineering's pretty not straightforward but yeah you do a slab some beams some bracing all that sort of stuff but and it's it's mathematical isn't it it's mathematical you've got to You've got to design things that are structurally adequate without being excessive. Like you, one plus one it has to equal two. Yeah, has to. And there is a bit of like, yeah, if it equals two, well, you might choose the beam that's rated at 2.1, but you're not going to choose the beam that's rated at three because no one's going to want to pay for that to put it in sort of thing. So you've got to find, you've got to find a balance between, yeah, your structure, practicality, ease of construction, all that sort of stuff. Um, I actually got asked to quote a pretty interesting build the other day and 
I said to the bloke, look, just give me a, give me a week. Let me see if I can – how I can make it work before I quote it because I'm not going to quote something if I think it's unrealistic. And this was a – it's like a – it was only really a small box, but it was four cantilevers supported on a, on a cross um, underneath with sort of concrete upturns and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's all sweet, but they've got a budget to work to and – make this work so I spent a bit of time and designed it before I'd even had the job just because I wouldn't want to take it on and then be like yeah well you can do it but that slab's 350 mil thick with 28 mil bar and or whatever it might be and the client turns around and goes oh I can't afford to build it you know like it's a fancy architectural sort of thing but I think looking at a project from the start talking to the builder if there's a builder engaged and getting his take on how he wants to do it because there's plenty of ways to skin the cat in this game and anyone can can have a crack at it but if you're on the same page as the builder that makes the project run so much smoother you spend a little bit more time up front and it saves a lot of time money and headaches down the track once the builder stood the steel up and he's got to have a stair void in there and oh how do I make that work sort of thing, you know? Like you you just got to try and complement the design from the architect or the building designer as best you can. So I think that's important to gauge from, from hearing you say that is that it doesn't hurt to spend a little bit of time up front getting to understand what your client wants, what they need, apply it in a practical sense. Is this a custom home design or is it a development are there other factors such as the site conditions, money, parameters, all sorts of different factors that go into the mix and then understand that to some degree yeah, before you go back and provide some sort of level of service? Exactly right because we're pretty fortunate now in sort of we've got frame manufacturers who can design and supply the frame prefabricated. So that removes the need for the engineer to provide a bracing layout and stuff like that um same with the floor system you've got companies that supply the timber they will design your floor system for you so you while you don't need the engineer to do that sort of stuff and like if you're doing a couple of single story dwellings or townhouses whatever it might be that are quite straightforward you you might want to sort of save your money on engineering and just get that done by the supplier which is fine but then as soon as something pops up on side and it doesn't quite go together as as you'd expected it to the first person you're on the phone to is the engineer and be like mate can you dig me out of this and which is fine like you know happy to help out but if you spend a little bit more time up front getting the engineer to get his take on it he'll be like oh yeah, you can't get your standard frame to work there because you've got a dirty big stair void and you need a wind beam in there. So, like, just things like that. That's it, that little bit of time up front saves some time in the back end. Yeah, I, I think so. And it's hard, to, it's hard to explain that to some clients. Obviously, budget is very, very important um, in all the projects that we do. So nobody wants to spend that little bit extra if they don't have to. Um, I think a lot of people realise... A lot of people that I work with realise now, yeah, it's, it's worth spending that bit more, in my case, on your services so that we don't have the hiccups down the track. So it's good feedback when people say that to you because it sort of it justifies where you're coming from, from your price point. And, and, and they're willing to pay for that practical and experience. Exactly. And they're willing to pay for that because it's adding the value to their project. So... Yeah, not saying that I'm the best at what I do or anything like that, but I like to think I have that practical approach, which whether it sets me apart, I don't know, but it certainly keeps the people that I work with coming back. And if you can find that strategy in your desired field, then you're laughing. Like if you can keep hitting that brief and continue to add value to people, They'll keep coming back. It's just how it goes, I think. It's Th- that, that, that's what I've noticed. And it's that thinking outside the box mentality. Yeah. 
when not building or designing buildings, what uh, what does Cal like to do outside of work? Oh, I've got a lot of hobbies. Um, as I touched on before, I'm a bit of a hobby beekeeper. Um, that takes up quite a lot of time. Um, surfing, fishing, got a, um, got a little boy at the moment and, yeah, he keeps us very busy. Um, my wife's 110 percent supportive and backs me in everything I do and I try and do as much family time as I can I'm a pretty hands-on dad um, with the sort of flexibility I try and spend a bit of time with him through the week while I can and yeah he loves it I love it give the missus a little bit of a reprieve you know Um, but yeah I uh, yeah a lot of surfing a lot of fishing try and get to the snow every now and again Um, but yeah and now that you've got a family and your business is going pretty well, what what's it like looking back now on the younger cow that first started and took the plunge? Oh, mate, I was I was twenty eight when I started um, Apical and couldn't have done it without my missus. Like she's backed me the whole way. She's a legend. I don't know how she did it to be honest with you, um, but yeah, I was I was very nervous about doing it. Like I thought I needed to be more accomplished in my career and stuff um i've worked with some brilliant people and i was like oh am i am i ready to sort of join not join that elitist or anything like that but take that next step and be yourself sort of thing and um i'm so glad i did uh it was yeah it was a great great opportunity and i'm so that that obviously helped the situation i think without that i think i was I still would have been okay. Um, it wouldn't have been as sort of quick and sort of ramped up as, as what it did. But, um, yeah, I think it, it would have been all right. And I've had people actually ask me, sort of friends, close friends and stuff, about whether they should do it. Um, I've got a mate who's a joiner actually and we were sort of – we're on a surf trip in Sumatra uh, a couple of years ago. My wife was pregnant and got it for me for my 30th birthday <laughs> – and I was like, are you sure about this? And she's like, yeah, go for it. You'll be right. And we're over there and he was, yeah, like, oh, mate, I'm doing a lot of stuff on the side, you know, like do you reckon I should do it? And I was like, mate, 100%. If you've got the clients there, go for it. Like it's, yeah, it's so rewarding seeing your, like the fruits of your labour, I suppose. And I'd like to think that the work-life balance would get a bit better. <laughs> I'm still striving for that. But I'm happy where I'm at and, yeah, I think I've got a really good network of people and, yeah, supportive family and stuff around me. So, yeah, it's good. I think you mentioned it earlier too where it comes back to the benefits and the rewards that you reap from having your own business far outweigh everything when you are going through those tough late nights and you know difficult demands that you have to just get the job done. Yeah, 100%. And... It's sort of short term pain, um, but it's it's a long term gain. Like I um yeah, I'm very fortunate. I've yeah, I take a few holidays each year and stuff and yeah, I've got that luxury to be able to go away and yeah, just just short ones, but it it works out so much better than if I was working for someone I'd I'd be sort of locked in and don't have that sort of flexibility. I can start late go for a fish or whatever and get a surf in if I'm lucky enough. doesn't happen often, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> I think last week I surfed on Wednesday or Thursday and that was the first time I'd had sort of a midweek surf all year, but that's just how it goes sometimes. You just you get in and get it done and, yeah. Okay, and with your structural engineering background and environmental background as well, what's your vision moving forward? Like where do you want to see yourself in, in the future? I've, my passion for structural engineering is still, yeah, 100% there and I'll continue that going. I've, um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in some um, more sustainable building products and building houses in a, in a different way, I suppose. The main one that I'm, yeah, excited about is uh, hemp masonry. So so, like so for the unwashed that are like me, what – can you explain it like hemp masonry so it obviously has hemp in it so it's basically the hemp that's then broken up into sort of small pieces crushed up i suppose you could say and then it's mixed with like a lime binder and it's 
installed by hand. So you basically have a, a form which is like a shutter that you just work up the wall as you go and you just hand compact it. It's um it's still sort of a typical house construction timber frame and stuff, but we've been doing like a three hundred mil thick wall, which is the the hemp masonry. Um and it's yeah, got great properties for insulation and things like that. And then you can leave it exposed or they put like a, a render on the outside and things like that. One of the projects that we've been working on recently is up at Shepherd's Ground. It's a eco village up in Butterwick, just out of Dungog. It was actually on Better Homes and Gardens the other day. Old Joanna Griggs got out there and had a crack out of herself. <laughs> um, but that, that was one of the houses that I was lucky enough to design. So there's there's a few eco villages popping up. There's one down the central coast that I'm working on as well and they're yeah, doing the hemp masonry as well. There's a builder in Dungog who sort of got me involved in it and he's a top bloke. He's building a house in Dungog now that's, yeah, all hemp masonry as well. So while it's still got your traditional timber frame, um, it's this sort of natural product. It's it's not bricks, it's not cladding or anything like that. And, yeah, you don't need to line it on the inside or anything like that. It's, yeah, it's really cool. I'm um, I'm pretty excited about it. I want to do more with it. There's some guys up in Byron and stuff that are that are pretty into it as well, and you sort of in that hemp masonry side of thing, you sort of you get like rammed earth, straw bale, and different sort of things like that. So I'm interested in that sort of thing uh, moving forward, sort of trying to steer away from your typical typical products. Um, been doing a few things with some architects um, and builders around passive house, so. You don't have your typical heating and cooling systems, and it's like a an airtight um, airtight membranes and things like that. So it reduces your heating and cooling costs, but also healthy air. One of the jobs that we're working on now actually is a prefabricated panel house. So all the panels are made in a workshop just in Cardiff, actually, and trucked to site, and you basically have a house stood up in a couple of days. So. There's some things on my Instagram, I think, actually, that have a bit of stuff on there. So, yeah, it's um, it's an exciting way of doing things and they can actually make this house, yeah, like water and air tight straight away. Like it's all taped and it's – it's I think it's got the potential to change the building game because you know yourself how long some frames stand in the weather for months months at a time – end up with mould and things like that in there which can't be great for health when once it's sealed up um but yeah this is magic in my opinion um it's still still sort of relatively new but there's different things like there's clt and stuff are are you familiar with that it's a cross laminated timber yes yeah so that's a different kettle of fish altogether um but it again is another quick construction cost i'm not across that from from an engineering side but the panel sort of system is yeah something that i'm yeah a bit passionate about and working with a local builder to try and do a bit more of it actually so i think uh you've mentioned two two key ingredients there where both of these factors are, are hot on every anyone that's in whether they're a designer an engineer or a builder or even a property developer those two key factors that everyone wants is time and obviously sustainability because they're the they're the two things that need to be improved moving forward so if you can sort both of those things out have a you know an amazing product that isn't all too foreign but you do get that buy in and you can prove the benefits i think it'll be a win win going forward i think so i think it it's probably going to take a little while because we get pretty set in our ways. Um, we've been build, building houses this way for, for a long time. Um, we're not changing too many things. We've still got bears and joists, still got a slab, all that. But, um, yeah, if we can if we can streamline the process, make it more sustainable um, and build better houses, then, yeah, like you say, it's a win-win. That's right. All right, Cal, I really appreciate you giving up your time today. It's uh, It's been wonderful having you on Build Hatch. And for our listeners out there who want to get into contact with you, besides going to your website, which will probably say coming soon, <laughs> <laughs> what's the best way to go about it? Do you have your Instagram you mentioned? Yeah, so you can get on um, get on my Instagram, Apical Engineering, or yeah, the website has all my details, but it, yeah, it is coming soon. So yeah, apicalengineering.com.au. I'll get there eventually. 
Well, there you go, it works. So, uh, yeah, once again, Cal, appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ad. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Well, that was Cal Heron from Apical Engineering. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. As you could tell, I found it very entertaining and thoroughly enjoyed myself. I think that was just a great reminder of how nice it is to work with very funny and entertaining people within your profession. A quick shout out to all those people who have been emailing and messaging me lately, encouraging me to keep bringing you these really interesting stories. Your words and messages of support really mean a lot to me, so thank you for writing in. And also to our Yankee build hatch following in the States. A quick shout out to you guys from down under. Words really spreading over there, which is really exciting. Have a great week, and you'll hear me on the airwaves again next week. Thanks for listening. You have experienced a Build Hatch developed production.